First of all, just welcome people. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, tell museum members that another edition of the Trotam Tribune will be coming your way on or about February 1st. Um, if you are a museum member, it'll come to your email. Um, if you are a member but haven't given us your email, be sure to send that to uh, trotommuseum at gmail.com. We don't have everybody's email somehow, but we'll, uh, we'll work on that. Uh, the museum, again, is scheduled to uh, reopen in May. We'll see how COVID is doing at that point. Um, we have some new exhibits to tell you about. Uh, we have an entire 1930s dental office that used to exist in Three Oaks. It's set up in the museum now. Um, and we have another exhibit about fire. It's the 150th anniversary of the Chicago fire, which also brought huge fires to, uh, to this area. So we're going to uh, have an exhibit on that. We have uh, exhibits on the on our road exhibits, road names and how they got there. We're doing Minnick Road and Martin Road. Uh, Minnick, we have some wonderful photos um, that have been collected over the years. And the Martins, as you may or may not know, have had reunions every year, family reunions for more than 150 years. So that's actually quite a story as well. Um, and then next month, we will have another Zoom um, program, the Songs of the Pioneers with the cooperation of the School of American Music in Three Oaks and uh, Garth Taylor, who's, who's done some of the scores for our documentaries. He's got rounded up some excellent musicians and, uh, and they're gonna be playing some of the songs that uh, in the 19th century were being sung in these parts. So uh, now I wanna to go to tonight's program, which is Harbor Country Hoodlums and some good guys as well. Uh, we tried to have this program last summer. Some of you may recall this painful memory. <laughs> uh, we fell as victim to Zoom hoodlums, and we think we've learned something about uh, uh, security in the Zoom platform since then, so I trust everything's going to go okay today. <laughs> Our presenter, as you uh, know, is Chris Lyon, who's worked in Berrien County Law Enforcement and is the author of A Killing in Capone's Playground. Um, I, I should have held up the book here, but I saw you have the graphic <laughs> okay. yeah, I presentation. Know. So I just want to one more thing before I let Chris take it away is that um, if a question does occur to you during the talk, I'd encourage you to write it out in the chat uh, function, and then we'll pass that on to Chris right after the talk. So with that, Chris, I'll let you take it away. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm going to try to share my screen. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. So All right. Well, um, we'll just get that minor uh, detail fixed here. Go ahead. I don't have any screen here to show you I think a PowerPoint. You here we go. And I'm going to share it there. Can you see it now? Yes. All right. Well, here's my first slide here. We, we got some Harbor Country hoodlums. Who would have who thought? And a few good guys too. But, you know, we want to kind of focus this in here. Uh, let's see if I have to how to advance this slide here. Let's do, there we go. This is the gangster era edition because, you know, we have so many hoodlums now and at other times and some good guys, you know, at different times. So we want to talk kind of about all of them in uh, the gangster era, especially. Now, really, what, what really brought about all of this was the Volstead Act, which we all know is prohibition, where in 1920, the government said, you can't drink alcohol, you can't transport it, you can't sell it, you can't do anything with it. And you're going to go to jail and get fined if you're caught with it. And this was starting in 1920. And, you know, this was kind of a, more of a slap in the face to a lot of the immigrants that were coming into, into the big cities. And it was um, something that the government really had a, a good intention, I think, with it. They thought that, you know, if we get rid of crime and we can get rid of, you know, uh, all these bad uh, influences that maybe we'd have a better society. But what actually happened was the opposite. Rise in crime, health concerns, because people were trying to make their own booze. You call the bathtub gin, 
where uh, you end up trying to trying to make something and it's and it's you know not healthy. And then of course we had lots of government corruption, you know, and it just people were getting paid off, you know, to be quiet, not see things, chaos, and and basically it, it took 13 years to figure out this was kind of a bad idea. And it was repealed in 1933. And, but unfortunately, it didn't go away. The gangster era was here to stay. Now, here's a, here's a nice, interesting slide because, you know, do we remember back before I-94 and before I-196 was built? And this is kind of, you know, to show you how a little bit of, it took a little longer to get places than, uh, than what we used to. And it, you know, US 12 was of course the main drag through town. And then we had M60 that went through Three Oaks and Galeen. Uh, so it wasn't an easy one way route. It was a lot of turns and corners. Um, and you know, we did have uh, a lot of areas that were very isolated, you know, just like it is kind of today, you know, in, in parts of Union Pier, Chickaming, very, very rough. Uh, very rugged and, and isolated. And here we have a, a actual moonshiners uh, bust that was in New Buffalo Township in this area. And you can see, you know, this is all hidden in the woods. And are the police gonna be able to, you know, find this? Well, they did. And and it's, it's hard to tell where this actually came from, but, you know, these were the kind of things that they would look for as these operate, these big operations, because people were, were making this gin. And of course, our biggest hoodlum of all was Al Capone. And we can all agree, he definitely was in this area. He definitely stayed in uh, Southwestern Michigan at, at some point. Now he went by, uh, people called him Scarface. Now, if you called him Scarface to his face, you might not make it out. So he, uh, he actually liked to go by the name Snorky. Snorky was his uh, nickname. And he was the head of the South Side Syndicate in Chicago. Um, we believe that his first visit to Benton Harbor, Berrien County was in 1920. And that was, uh, that was gonna be for the, uh, the Jack Dempsey uh, heavyweight championship uh, match that they were having. And then we believe uh, his last visit was, of course, in 1931, because at, right after that, he went to prison. So after that, he really wasn't here, but he, di he died in 1947. In fact, it was on the 25th, so the anniversary of his death. He was only 48 years old. When you think about it, it's like the guy lived like he was 80 years old, but he was only 48 when he died. Uh, a stroke um, brought on by the syphilis and, but he'd been in prison since 1931. So one of the places that he stayed at, uh, and of course he had to drive right through Harbor Country was uh, the Hotel Vincent in Benton Harbor. And he would come in with his fleet of Cadillacs, uh, large groups, uh, he was never alone. He always had a huge, huge uh, crowd around him. And another place he liked to stay was the Lakeside Inn. And of course, uh, I happen to have a connection now with the Lakeside Inn because I actually work there now and at Gordon Beach Inn. And so I'm completely just enamored by the fact that I get to work in such a historic inn and have all the stories uh, told and I can and tell people about the stories. But, we have, uh, we have rumors that we believe that he did stay at the Lakeside Inn. Now this was kind of a resort area. This wasn't necessarily that he spent the night, but he definitely had spent some time there. Another hoodlum, which was a friend of his, one of his, uh, his, his gurus, he was the money man. We named, he was called Jake Guzik. And he was actually a Russian Jew. And so, and you think a lot of times gangsters are all Italians. Well, no, this, you know, they, they range in all kinds of ethnicities. 
And he was the money man. He was the guy they called the greasy thumb because he was always constantly, you know, to, handing out money to pay off people. So he had a greasy thumb. But he did own a farm in Lincoln Township. And apparently the farm has been, you know, uh, rezoned and all, it doesn't exist anymore. But he was in the area. Another hoodlum that a lot of people will uh, remember is Phil D'Andrea. He was his bodyguard and he lived on uh, in St. Joe over by the hospital on Highland. And he uh, lived there since 1924. This is the house with the tunnel in it that everybody talks about. And yes, there was a tunnel and the tunnel is no longer there now. It's been uh, boarded up and, and sealed up. Um, in fact, in the, in the original house, the tunnel was there before the house was built. The tunnel was actually used as a brick chute. So a lot of people had this idea that tunnels were used as escape routes and, and you sneak out to the river. Well, you know, when Capone came to town, he didn't, he didn't need to escape. He was here having fun and people liked him. They wanted him here. So it, it actually was a, a lot different, but he lived in, in this house and he's portrayed uh, as being the guy that brings the gun into Al Capone's um, tax evasion trial. Um, he's the, a lot of movies will have, will feature him in there. Um, he was, he eventually was convicted and left the area in 1943. This is the house today. Uh, it's an Italian Renaissance style, and this house still exists. It's in a, a, a neighborhood now, and you really can't get a good look at it until you get out there. Another one of his hoodlum friends was Louis Campagna, called Little New York. And he was another bodyguard, just like uh, Phil D'Andrea. He uh, actually lived in Berrien Springs and an 80-acre estate. Um, he also was convicted of the same crimes. Uh, this is an overview of, of his house. Uh, this also, we all know as the uh, Muhammad Ali residence. Muhammad Ali actually bought the residence after, um, after obviously he was uh, long gone. And so the big C that was written and stamped on his iron gates in his front um, actually stood for Campagna, and a lot of people thought it stood for the champ. Well, it might have made you a good one for the champ, but it actually was uh, for Campagna. And this was the first in-ground pool in the area, courtesy of the Chicago Public Works. So I guess when you are a gangster and you know people, you can get things done, you know. Another uh, hoodlum, uh, another member of the Capone outfit was called Paul Riccia, uh, the waiter. And apparently they couldn't think of a better name to give him. So they just call him the waiter uh, because that's what he was doing at the time. But he actually went and bought a house just south of uh, Harbor Country there in Lake, uh, on Lake Michigan in Long Beach. And I kind of consider Long Beach like an extension of like Michiana. Um, he lived there and then he built his sister a house in 1937 and uh, the address there is 3001 Northmore Trail and that's the one that's supposed to be shaped like a gun. That's what everybody says. Um, he also got wrapped up in all these convictions so he left the area in 43. Uh, the house was sold in 53 to the, the, uh, the Teamsters Union and somebody named uh, like uh, a, a famous person that was part of the Teamsters bought it and uh, Jimmy Hoffa maybe uh, apparently was involved. So, you know, he kind of wanted to use it for training facilities, which is kind of an odd thing for a, a sprawling estate with a pool, uh, tennis courts, you know, good training for uh, the Teamsters uh, union in that case. This was uh, one of his images. Now this is, uh, I took this off of like Zillow or realtor.com. And this is supposed to be the, the address on Northmore Trail. That's a house shaped like a gun. I don't, I can't see it. I don't know if you need an aerial view of it, but uh, it, 
obviously has a different shape to it. So I guess use your judgment on that if you think it looks like a gun. But one of my uh, newest hoodlums that I, I get excited about talking about because not a lot of people know him was Ed Convalenka. And he was, you know, of course, in this photo, he looks like a family man and a, you know, pristine guy. He was a very corrupt uh, Chicago Cicero politician back in the early 20s. And he became very friendly with the outfit. In fact, he was um, basically the one who welcomed Al Capone and his gang to come to Cicero. So we know Cicero as a very heavy gangster area from that day. And that was because of Mr. Ed Convalenka. Now Convalenka's were um, from Union Pier area. And he purchased an estate after you know his Cicero uh, home uh, at the at the corner of Golden Gate and Lakeshore, also in Long Beach, uh, and he called it the the Bella Casa. Um, his wife Rose, uh, seen there also, she was a beautician and she had a couple shops locally. Uh, as far as we know, she was pretty decent. I don't know if she was aware of all of his misdeeds. Um, but it's an interesting case. The Unfortunately, his, uh, his niece, Ruth Majenski, just passed away here uh, last month. She gave me a lot of information about the Convalenkas. And she did reiterate that Ed was the only bad one out of the group, that the rest of the Convalenkas were all straight and narrow. And for some reason, he just got wrapped up into some the, the criminal element. And uh, a lot of things happened at his estate. This was the Bella Ca uh, Casa uh, picture. And it kind of does look like, a, look like that, um, also in Long Beach. Now, another uh, hoodlum that I'm more familiar with is, is Fred Killer Burke. And now he was more of a hitman rather than a gangster, but he was involved in some gangs, Egan's Rats out of St. Louis, the Purple Gang out of Detroit. Uh, but he was also a bank robber, jewelry thief, a kidnapper, con man. He was, he was all wrapped up into one guy and he was an expert at Thompson submachine guns and shooting them. And Capone got wind of this and said, you know, this is somebody I need on my team. So we tried to recruit uh, Fred Burke for uh, some, you know, simple crimes uh, that he could handle in uh, Chicago. And, uh, and Burke took him up on it. And it was believed a very, it's alleged, but very strongly alleged because we can't ever solve this crime. Uh, that it is uh, that he was involved with the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Now, he purchased a home on Red Arrow Highway in Stevensville in September of 29. And then just not long after that, in December 14th, is when he shot and killed uh, St. Joe police officer Charles Skelly. And that's kind of the purpose of my book that I wrote. It was really the story of that. This is the house. It is still standing. Uh, obviously, the, the one on the left is the, the 1929 version. Now we've got a, a more modern version of the house, which essentially looks the same. Um, at the time I took the picture, it was a Caldwell Banker real estate, but now it is Remax on the lake, it's called. So they have a uh, they have a lot of, of neat things in there. They really do celebrate the house. I, I showed them a couple of the, the hidden passageways that we verified were in there. And it is uh, a house that I wish the walls could talk and, and, and learn something from it. Uh, this was some of the items that were found in the house. And this is what gives us the alleged uh, killer in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, because he happened to have found, uh, happened in, have in his house were two Thompson submachine guns, which were then ballistically tested to be, have, have been used in the massacre. So by, just by having that evidence alone, you know, he's, he had to have been involved because he had it hidden and never expected anybody to find it. So 
Uh, he had quite a bit of uh, ammunition. Um, all of it matched up with, with, with what they found at the massacre scene. So he was pretty much the guy. Now we want to talk about some good guys. At least we think we're we think they're good. We don't know, but we've got a guy named John Flynn. Which, if you live in Sawyer, and you you are definitely familiar with John Flynn. In fact, this is probably the most uh, talked about person that I get asked whenever I do a presentation. Is what's the scoop with with the Flynn Mansion and Flynn and Capone and Flynn and everybody? Uh, hanging out with the gangsters. Well, you know, they, he went by Skinny Flynn. Obviously, uh, it was a play on his, uh, his name there. And he was the leader of the Teamsters Excavating Union in Chicago. Um, he was a, uh, a brilliant man who built and ran the Flynn's Sawyer or, or the Flynn's uh, soda grill in downtown Sawyer and was very integral in the in Sawyer developing the way it did. Um, people always call it the Flynn Mansion, which I put it in quotations because I certainly don't think it looks like a mansion, but maybe at the time that's what they thought was a mansion, but people still refer to it as the Flynn Mansion. Um, now he was alleged to have been associated with Capone and the outfit, but I absolutely have never found any proof of anything that he was connected to Capone. Um, I can only find good things about him. And, and it's honest, honest to God, I cannot find anything about him doing anything. Um, he may have had a few run-ins with the unions, but a lot of that was going on already. So it wasn't anything different. Now in this article, they rave about, this was from the News Palladium, the local paper, and you know, they rave about him, that he's, he created the Sawyer and he's such a great guy. Um, he's, he's boosted business. You know, he may look like a gangster, but he absolutely was not uh, in that area. He, he was into uh, making, making the town better and he did a lot of public service. Now they describe his home here as a farm home about a mile south of Sawyer and it's known as the Flynn Stock Farm. And so it was an actual working farm. Um, and so, you know, it, it, I seem to think that, you know, he was, he had other aspirations to, you know, farming um, and, and, you know, relaxing in the area because it still was a, a, a nice area. Um, this is his mansion. And this is a courtesy of Nick here. Um, I just don't see it as a mansion. I think of it as more of a bungalow style house, but it certainly, you know, was probably a little extravagant for the times considering in the depression era. Um, but it is a, um, it, it is still there. You can drive by it on Flynn road. And um, this is a nice, this is a nice picture from, uh, from this collection. Now here's one of the buildings right downtown Sawyer that he built and it's still standing. And uh, this is where he had his soda grill. And you can see this picture uh, shows him right behind the counter. You know, he's working with the, he's got the hat on. And, you know, this looks like a, a fun place to be and raved about the theater raved about the soda grill and just having a lot of fun in Sawyer. Now, when I, what I found out about the Flynn family wasn't anything about John Flynn, it was about his son, his son, Thomas Flynn, who in 1948 is arrested for basically inciting a riot and burning cars and, and destroying property uh, during uh, some union issues. Uh, at Nylon Products Company that was in Benton Harbor. And he, like his father, he went into being a leader of the union, um, the local union there, and he was arrested um, while they were striking and they were actually flipping cars over, burning them. So he got charged with uh, malicious destruction of property, inciting a riot. You know, and, and so he, of all the people, was the bad guy, the hoodlum uh, of all of it. So I don't know if this ever got, you know, talked about amongst people, but um, his son was really kind of a, a troublemaker, 
than more than anything. Now, another good guy, and I haven't found anything bad about him, so maybe there's still some story behind him, but Anton Cermak. You know, we've heard, we always hear the name Cermak, you know, when we go to Chicago, but he was the mayor of Chicago uh, just for a, a brief period of time, uh, two years, essentially. And uh, unfortunately, he was uh, with Franklin Delano Roosevelt in Miami, Florida in uh, 1933. He was shaking hands with him and, and Anton Cermak was actually shot. And he did die three weeks later of complications. Um, it was an assassination attempt on Roosevelt and he basically took the bullet for him. Um, he did have a second home in Lakeside and Again, the stories are that he played cards with Al Capone at the Lakeside Inn. Now, is it bad for a mayor to hang out with a gangster of the, you know, maybe it was good business, you know, you know, it could have been, you know, just a simple card game, you know, where you, you just do that. But that's, that's one of the stories. And I've always wanted to get that, you know, validated somehow. Now this is uh, his house and he does, he does live uh, off of Marquette, or say this was his house in New Buffalo Township. And these pictures are, um, I'm not sure what, how old they are, Nick, but uh, a little older you can tell, um, but it is a nice, uh, nice little like plot of land there, a little bit bigger than the normal size plot uh, or plot, um, sections there but I love the stone features of this property and the landscaping it's just absolutely stunning and and this was a more modern picture that Nick had uh, and you can again see the stone um, stone uh, part of the house and the chimney this sits right on the lake so I'm sure that um, they get the you know the get to view a view that like nobody else um, but I have, I have yet to go buy this house, but yes, I, it's, it's on my list, short list. Another good guy that we had was George E.Q. Johnson. And I guess there's probably, everybody always want to know what the E.Q. stood for. And I found out it was for Eugene Quentin. And he did have a son who was the junior. So this is the, the senior version. He was the United States attorney, uh, the Northern District of Illinois. And he was the guy who convicted Al Capone and several other, other of the gang members for tax evasion. Now, remember, they couldn't get him for murder. They couldn't get him for the uh, bootlegging or any of this other other criminal element racketeering and things, but they could get him on tax evasion and they went after him and they convicted him. Now he did have a second home. It says Lakeside, but I also found that it was in Harbert. I'm not really sure where it's at. So that's one of my other goals is to find out. But apparently when he died, they did, uh, um, he died in Chicago, but he, um, he, his son died in Lakeside. So I don't know if it was the same house or not, um, but I would like to find that out. Now, another good guy that uh, is kind of goes unrecognized was a John Terrell. He was the former assistant Illinois state's attorney. And then he was, he became an attorney for some Capone uh, affiliates. So he kind of went from being a, uh, actually the prosecutor for the Black Sox scandal of 1919, where you know about the story where they threw the game, uh, uh, they were paid to throw the game uh, on that. And uh, Arnold uh, Rothstein, I believe was the gangster that, that paid him off to do it. Um, but after, um, after he did that, he got into some pr like private practice. He had a second home in Long Beach and uh, scarily it was bombed. It blew up in January of 1929. Now it made uh, the news and, and of course I don't have a photo of him, but the little article talked about uh, him, be, the house being dynamited. Now, now Terrell alleged, oh, it was just a kerosene stove that blew up. But they said, no, it was a bomb. There was literally a bomb in there and they believe it was gangster related. So 
I guess when you work with gangsters, you got to be real careful of who you blame and who you talk about. But this one um, actually blew his house completely up. They said there was timber thrown, you know, hundred, you know, a couple hundred feet away. It was. It ended up in the lake, um, you know. And this was uh, in Long Beach. So, you know, and I don't have an address. Obviously, I don't even know if the house got rebuilt or not. But this was his second home. So basically, this is just a touch of some of the bad guys, some of the good guys from the gangster era. This is the book I wrote it, called A Killing in Capone's Playground. I did win the Indie Excellence Award for Best in True Crime in 2015. Um, and right now, of course, you know, with COVID, everything's available online, um, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, In-Depth Editions is my uh, publisher. And I, I have my uh, email address there because of course, if we don't get to all your questions tonight, I wanna make sure that you can email me if you have any questions, if you have any comments, you wanna add to the story, you have any photos to share. And of course, you know, we want to we want to give a shout out to the region of the Three Oaks Museum and the friends of the New Buffalo Library. You guys have been wonderful with having all these programs and continued education throughout because it is important to keep that out. And, you know, I could do another another story about some of the other events that have happened in Harbor Country. Uh, in later times, I could do, you know, we got Jesse Owens that stayed at the Gordon Beach Inn and he used to run up and down Lakeshore Road to, uh, to practice and, and, and he was a, a big supporter of Union Pier and, um, and now that I work at Gordon Beach Inn, I'm learning a lot more about the Jewish culture that was present for Dr. Gordon. So, Actually, it's just, it's been fascinating to learn more about our, our history here. And I'm going to throw it back to Nick for questions and more comments and anything else you want to do. Thanks, Chris. Um, I, I have a couple of questions, but I, again, will encourage people if they have questions to put them in the, the chat uh, room. Uh, for one is uh, any idea why Al Capone was snorky? You know, that was just a name that I guess, I guess a lot of people were called Snorky. For some reason, they just came up with the name Snorky, but he loved that name. Now, you could call him that, and he loved it, but now, don't ever call him Scarface. <laughs> right. Let me ask you about the Hotel Vincent. You showed that picture. That looks to me like what's now called the Whitcomb. Is that, is that no, right? No, it's actually called the, the Vincent Place. It's, it's, it's in downtown Benton Harbor, right on Main Street. Um, and it still exists. It's still the tallest building basically in Benton Harbor. It is still there. And it's just, what, what they did is they subdivided all of the, the uh, floors. So now there's, there's really nothing left of the original inside. There's no lobby, there's no, you know, um, anywhere, the ballroom and the dining area. They, uh, they made it into uh, office space. But when Capone would come into town, he reserved the entire eighth floor, which was the top floor. And he had all of his bodyguards, all of his, his moles with him, his, uh, his girlfriends and hanger honors. And you know, if you got to hang out with Al Capone, you were pretty cool back then. So kind of like the Kardashians, you know, you just, when you, you get this entourage and you just go and everybody follows you around and that's kind of how it was back in the day with Al Capone. You're the, you're the first person I've heard compare the Kardashians to Al Capone. But all right. yeah. I, I well, I, you know, I used, I used I lived, to compare him to I Trump. Suburb, I lived in a suburb of Miami and Capone, while he was having his mansion built in Miami Beach, lived on the top floor of a, a small condo building there, a small apartment building. Oh, wow. And of course, the reason he's on the top floor is because his guys are up on the roof looking oh, yeah. up to who's around. So, Yeah, and it was very strategic the way he did it. And he had his bodyguards with him at all times. And, you know, and a lot of people would say that, you know, well, he would go out and do this and he would do that. You know, he always had his bodyguards with him and he always had, 
you know, a following. I mean, he was, he was a popular guy. And I used to compare him to Trump before Trump became the president, you know, like kind of like a, a, you know, a businessman, wealthy, has a big following, but, you know, when, it, when he became president, it kind of changed the dynamics. But, but so now I compare him to kind of like the Kardashians is just kind of uh, in, a, in that realm. Chris, if, you, if you'll unshare the screen for a minute, I wanted to share yeah. something. I got something that I wanted to just, uh, Let's see how I, Oh, oh, stop share. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe I can do this. All right. Um, oh, yes. There you go. Let me. Let me uh, oh, the Flynn Theater. Yes. Yeah. Well, this is the, yeah, the Flynn Theater um, poster that the, the building that you showed is, of course, it's the main building in downtown Sawyer, right in front of the, the garden center. And I was told, yes, uh, I think it was Jerry Olson. Um, he said that his father told him that when the Flynn Theater was being built, that city of Chicago trucks would pull up oh. full of construction materials and drop them off. Um, so Flynn was, I believe it. Flynn was a fairly upstanding citizen here, but he also had some interesting connections and probably some, um, well, I mean, here's, here's another, this is a clip out of the Tribune. Yes. It, yeah. It, when it you had, bomb. Yep. But, and I talked to uh, somebody who, who was an expert in labor history and said, you think that means he was a gangster? And his reply was, if you were the head of the Teamsters Union in Chicago back in that day, you you better have some tough guys around you. So you weren't you weren't yep. with uh, with choir boys and Girl Scouts. You had to have some really tough. Yeah, people. and so there there was also the yes. rumor that that Flynn fled Chicago because he had a little of the Teamsters money he shouldn't have. Now I never I never confirmed that. Um, but well, and, and it's, it's very true that, that, you know, in a lot of, in a lot of times that I've uh, researched, um, it was right after prohibition ended that, okay, well, the gangsters need something now to do. And so what they did is they started doing the union hustling and they were, they actually were doing a lot of Hollywood stuff where they were trying to, you know, mess around with the, with, with Hollywood and, and try to bilk them out of money. And that's basically what got them, what got a lot of them put in prison because of the, the union hustling and the pressure on that. So, uh, you know, there, there was a lot of uh, union issues back in the day. And I, and so that was the only connection that I could come up with, with Flynn and, and the unions and Capone, because that was, but see, Capone was already in prison in 31, and in 33 is when the uh, prohibition ended, and they needed a new gig. They needed something new to do, so they went to gambling, horse racing. Uh, they were already doing prostitution and you know that sort of thing, but they needed the union hustling, and that was their next gig after that. So Mary Bolt uh, has has typed in that she had this a family legend that Al Capone and friends were found raiding the apple orchard belonging to my grandfather, Herbert Gowdy, one of the- Oh yeah, the Gowdy, yeah. Gowdy Road, yes. Yeah. See, and I love it when they- My grandfather decided not to confront them was, uh, was the last sentence. <laughs> yeah. Kind of been a wise, wise decision. Yes. <laughs> you know, and, what, and one of the odd, odd stories about um, Capone was told to me by historian uh, Robert Myers, who was the curator at the, at the Historical Society. And he said that when Al Capone would come to Benton Harbor, he wanted to go see the House of David baseball team because the guys all had the long hair, the long beards, but they would tuck their hair up up under their baseball caps. So he would go out there and, and start shouting, show me your hair, show me your hair. And the guys looked at him like, you know, who the hell are you, you know? And, you know, just to think, you know, who would ever do that to Al Capone? You would never, you know, cross him like that. But these guys didn't care. They didn't know who he was. And, and they certainly weren't gonna be on a show for this, so. <laughs> So it was kind of it was kind of fun that they that they actually did it like that. So I also wanted to add with regard to Anton Cermak that uh, his house is still there and it's a really interesting place. There's um, there's glass, uh, colored glass stuck in the in the uh, mortaring all around the house. Oh and wow! Because it, it belonged to a guy who had he owned a glass company in Chicago. He stuck all that stuff in, and he was also a big Democratic Party supporter. So Cermak 
It was yeah. It, the other thing about Cermak is he would bring a lot of people over for weekend parties that apparently included lots of bootleg booze and card games. All Absolutely. Time. And that's where a lot of like, they call it the corruption, but you know, the, the guys would explain it. Like even the police officers would say, you know, we're humans too. You know, we, we like to drink, you know, and you know, the law, you know, it, it was a law of the land, but you know, that's not necessarily, you know, you, you expect the police officers to follow the laws, but you know, they were humans and they wanted to have a drink after work. And, and so a lot of it was in that realm too, where, you know, these judges and, you know, like, I think Al Capone, one of his quotes was, you know, I serve, you know, the judges of, of Cook County, you know, and, and, you know, some of them are my best customers. <laughs> and, you know, and he was right because the, the draw for alcohol and the need for alcohol was there and they fulfilled the need. And, you know, he was actually pretty, pretty smart about it. And he became, you know, and they always say, you know, he, the, he could have been a CEO of a company. He literally, he ran his gang like a company. And a lot of people would say, well, you know, I, I, Capone did this and Capone did that. It's like, well, Capone was the CEO of the gang. He's not going to be the guy going and making the contacts with the people. He's going to be the guy sitting in the, his uh, office you know, expecting his lieutenants to go do all the work. And a lot of people were killed. You know, they, they can attribute several murders to Capone and whether or not they're, they're not proven, you know, no, it, witnesses always end up dying. Somebody doesn't want to testify. And next thing you know, he's off, he's off and no charges filed. So from what you've been saying, it doesn't sound like he was suspected of murders here. He really did go on vacation no. when he was out here, I guess. <laughs> yeah, there was there was a couple. I did find a couple of murders that were gang related, gangster related. One of the guys was uh, supposedly involved with shooting uh, Tony. Uh, uh, there was a there was a gangster that was his name was Tony, and he was killed. And then all of a sudden, we have a, a, a dead Italian wash up over at Misba Park, which is just north of Benton Harbor, Hager Shores area. And he was dressed in an Italian suit, but had absolutely no ID on him and nobody could ever identify him. And they, the Chicago police even did uh, a, you know, fingerprints and they couldn't identify him, but they ended up taking him back to Chicago because they think he was dumped here um, so it's, uh, it is interesting, but I don't think it would have had to do with Capone, but it certainly could have been some of his people. Kurt, Kurt Fess uh, has a question that said, it's neat to see the commercial building built by Flynn and Sawyer. Did any of the gangsters contribute anything to the Michiana community? Obviously, Flynn contributed something fairly substantial, whether or not you call him a gangster, it's still if Yeah, so yeah. Any and other examples of, no. of gangsters? Well, you know, when like Capone came into town, they said everybody just ran into place. Like when, when they saw the, the fleet of Cadillacs come into town, everybody wanted, was jumping and, and wanting to help. Now he utilized the uh, seamstresses in town to refit uh, his pockets because they said his pockets, he'd keep his gun in it. And when he'd pull his gun out, he'd rip the seams out. So we would have them reinforce the seams of the pockets. They use the, the beauty shop. In fact, you know, if you can believe it or not, Al Capone got his nails done. He had his manicured nails. He had his, he had eyebrow waxing, you know, some of the things that you certainly don't think of a gangster, a tough guy doing, but he would have massages. Um, so a lot of the community members uh, loved him. I mean, because when he came into town, he gave them business and he gave them tips. And in a time of the depression, that was that was like your life, you know, savings right here. I'm, I'm getting, I'm actually going to pay my mortgage or pay my rent this, this month because of Capone. And they, you know, and that was a surprising thing that I, that I learned because I thought, you know, why would they allow, why would our community allow a man like Capone in the area? 
And it turns out, well, actually, because he was a pretty good guy, you know, he, he was the guy that would give the kid the ice cream, you know, and he would, uh, you know, he would, re he was very respectful when uh, he went into restaurants, like if they said, hey, hey buddy, no guns in the in their store, no guns. He would make his bodyguard stand outside with the guns. I mean, he totally respected the people. Um, you know, I can't think of any instance where he had any run-ins with anybody in this area. Uh, now, Julie, did you have a question? Julie, there's a half a question in the type, typed okay. in part. Julie, do you? <laughs> uh, oh, stop, just talk. Go ahead. Yeah, yes. you can talk too. <laughs> okay, everybody. Uh, you. The ones from Three Oaks kind of knew Ben Canola. He lived into his mid to late 90s, and he always told me that he would drive uh, whiskey uh, in a car to the, I think it was the Gulf Moor Hotel. And he oh, said, yeah. because he was so young, they they weren't, he <laughs> could he could blend in. Yep. And, uh, he was quite the character and he, he had old 38 handgun and he could talk the talk and walk the walk. And later he owned several bars and he had quite a few slot machines. So he's yeah. uh, gone now, but that's what well, he that's told a shame, But yeah, that, that is very true. They had, they did, they, that's where your bootleggers came in. You know, they weren't necessarily the gangsters, but they were the low level guys that would do the, the booze running and the drop offs. And, you know, it, it was it was like, you know, if you're young, you know, who's going to suspect that you're, uh, you know, a mole here? You know, it's like a, these drug runners that, that that drive their vehicle and with all the drugs. But it's uh, it's very interesting. And, and it is true that. I bet we all have some somebody in our family history that probably did some bootlegging. And in fact, Michigan was one, uh, well, being Detroit, Michigan, about they said 75% of all alcohol, all illegal alcohol came out of Michigan through Detroit because it was coming from Canada. Now they could make it, they just couldn't drink it. So they could make it and then they, they would sell it you know, to people in Detroit, they would actually literally cross the Detroit River when it was frozen over and take sleds and whatever else they could to bring the booze over. And, you know, that booze all got, where did it go? Right down I-94, I guarantee you. Or U.S. 12, <laughs> but it would been U.S. 12, at the, or you, it, it would be M60 or U.S. 12 at the time. But they well, was, had, the, was the booze made in Harbor Country supplying <laughs> Chicago or was it just for local consumption? Do you know? You know, that's a good question. I know that one of the comments that Fred Burke made when he was in in the Berrien County Jail was that we have the best grape wine anywhere. He really loved our grape wine. So I know what they did with a lot of that, the fruit and the fruit industry here was the far, of course we had farmers that were everywhere. They, the, some of the low level gangsters were actually offering large sums of money for the fruit, the grapes, you know, to make the wine and all, all the other, uh, all the other items that you would use for alcohol. And what they did was, you know, you couldn't even get that at the market if you wanted to. So they were literally getting like triple or quadruple what they would get selling to the gangsters. So a lot of the, a lot of the fruit and, and other items, the wheat and the barley was used to make alcohol. And I don't know if it was made oh, here or me, if it was sent there and they made it over in Chicago. Let me uh, let me read something that Suzanne has uh, has put in. My grandfather, Ernest, I guess, Geipel, uh, had a farm on Glen Lord Road. And I found one in one of the papers that he had been fined for wine that he made during <laughs> prohibition. He was a German immigrant and that culture didn't consider beer and wine to be a problem. He grew various fruits on the farm. And that I can guarantee you is absolutely true because, and that was the, the one thing that I think a lot of people were against with the prohibition because they, they felt the government was targeting immigrants. 
you know, we had, you know, a, an influx of immigrants coming in and then, you know, in the big cities. And of course you have your Irish people who, who, who used alcohol as, you know, celebration. We had other ethnic groups that, you know, obviously Germans, you know, we, we are beer drinkers, you know, I, I'm a part German too. So, I mean, we, you know, when you start saying, you know, you can't do this and you can't do that, people took it as a slap in the face to the immigrants. And, and there might have been a slight, you know, attitude with it. But, you know, you, it's something like that where you take that as, you know, a serious thing, you know, that you're, you're infringing on my rights and my, you know, cultural you know, things that I do. And it had nothing to do with getting drunk and being stupid and committing crimes. It was just part of their culture. And so it was a very offensive to a lot of people. And I think that's why it didn't go over as well as the government wanted it to be. And, and as you pointed out, even even the judges and the cops and everybody else were drinking, yeah. drinking booze. So it's, it's sort of unsustainable. Uh, Law yeah. and the enforcement people were, were violating. <laughs> we're, we're pretty much hard up on um, getting close to eight o'clock. I, I did, oh my. I had earlier um, said that our next program is gonna be about songs of the pioneers. And um, I did wanna give a slight, uh, first of all, thank, thank you, Chris, very much. <laughs> Absolutely, very I'm honored. Um, I did wanna give a quick sneak preview of the next Zoom program, um, again, some musicians from the um, School of American Music in Three Oaks recorded a dozen numbers. We've recorded them all and I'm editing them into videos. But um, I'm gonna share the screen and show you the first of those, which was a song called Michigan IA, um, which, which essentially was a, a marketing device for Michigan. When they were in the 1830s, they were trying to get people to move from the East to, uh, to Michigan and- oh, this, I this song, this song was uh, one of the ways they did that, so. Come all you Yankee farmers who'd like to change your lot Who's spunk enough to travel beyond your native spot And leave behind the country where mom and dad used to Come and take your fortune in Michigan, I Tis you that talk in Vermont. What place is that? It's sure the girls are pretty and the cattle very fat. But who would like the mountain? The clouds and snow to stay when you can buy a prairie in Michigan. I this land was quite productive, everything for use. There's plenty of good cider and lots of maple juice. The apples grow this way, and quite delicious peaches in Michigan.
So again, that's just a little preview. Again, a dozen, they've recorded a dozen songs. Oops. I think I actually have to turn off, uh, turn off YouTube. Hi, Ron and Dee. Sorry? Um, so anyway, that, that's sometime next month, we'll have all those videos together and uh, we'll, they deal with the lake, the lake uh, shipping traffic, they deal with railroad building, uh, domestic chores, farming. Uh, it's really, it was a fun excursion through folk music to, uh, to think about this, this area. So we, um, if you were on the list to get word of this, you'll be on the list to get word of that. And I hope you all can join us then. Uh, again, thanks so much, Chris. Thank you all for coming. And uh, I guess with that, I'll, I'll adjourn the meeting. Thanks.